I'm going to speak about the question of what is the state of refractive surgery today, marketing versus science. Here are my financial disclosures. To consider this question specifically in the context of marketing versus science, I want to first talk through the phases of product development. Firstly, there is an initial idea and a feasibility study with a single case or maybe a small sample. Uh, which usually shows excellent or at least promising results. At this point, the marketing usually kicks in and can either represent the new product idea uh, with cautious or selective information, or it can sometimes be hyped up with what turn out to be false promises or exaggerated claims. After the first study, larger trials are undertaken, and the questions are, can these studies replicate the level of success? Are they unanticipated complications that are, that are found? And there's always the question of long-term safety and long-term stability. The product or treatment then goes through a development process where the techniques and product are refined or redesigned to further improve the results. The marketing, of course, continues throughout this process. Finally, each product reaches an endpoint where it either is abandoned due to inadequate safety or efficacy or longevity, or it becomes established, providing a repeatable, safe result and subsequently continues to be improved by wide scale use. So I'd like to walk through a couple of examples to give you a flavor of the different paths taken by some common treatments that we have today. I want, to, I want to start with one of the more complicated examples, uh, that of Wavefront-guided custom LASIK. Uh, this was first published in three eyes in the year 2000 and was described as a feasible approach. The second paper later that year from the same group showed that correction of aberrations was not yet optimal, but it also uh, said that supernatural vision can be achieved. This latter point is what was picked up by the marketing machine and phrases like we're going to flatten the wavefront and patients will have supervision and they'll be able to see the pixels on their television screen and the televisions will be unpleasant to look at. Further studies continued to find that the correction of aberration was insufficient. A literature review that we did in 2010 of papers reporting outcomes of wavefront guided treatments in highly aberrated eyes showed that there was only a very modest uh, reduction in spherical aberration of about 30% if you averaged all the studies. So the first area for development was to understand why aberrations were being undercorrected. One area of improvement was the resolution of the aberrometers being used to plan the treatments. In the earliest um, devices, in many cases, the resolution was so low that it was only possible to make measurements in eyes that hardly had any aberrations. In, in, in other words, eyes that had aberrations couldn't really be measured with these low resolution aberrometers. Another factor that came to light was the importance of centration. By definition, a wavefront guided treatment is centered on the pupil center, and this is where the wavefront measurement is calculated from. However, in patients with an angle kappa, this has led to many cases of decentration, particularly for hyperopic treatments. The next question was the refractive accuracy. Uh, in our study, we found that outcomes were more predictable when using the manifest refraction with the WASCA highest resolution aberrometer at the time than had we used the wavefront refraction from that aberrometer. But the biggest issue with wavering guided treatments is that most patients have very low aberrations to begin with, which are then heavily outweighed by the aberrations that are induced by the treatment. We know that spherical aberration is mostly due to peripheral stromal expansion due, by, due to biomechanical changes, not reflection projection errors. And you know, we know therefore that wavefront guided treatments are basically like sprinkling fairy dust on a cornea in a sea of induced spherical aberration. And so despite all this knowledge and science, the marketing train continues and still continues with this supervision message. 
So in summary, classical wavefront guided treatments have been largely abandoned by surgeons who have access to wavefront optimized treatments. But it's also become established for surgeons who are using older systems without an optimized option because the base profile of these so-called wavefront guided treatments give them the aspheric profiles that reduce the induction of spherical aberration. So the second example I want to talk about is topography guided treatments. Let's remember that this isn't new. The first topography guided treatments were done in 1998, but the marketing around topography guided treatments at that time was identified as a therapeutic treatment for cases of decentration or irregular astigmatism. There were no claims of supervision or spherical corneas for everyone uh, with a normal cornea to start with. In the early experience with topography guided uh, treatments, one of the major issues was the refractive accuracy. This was improved with the second generation of topography guided algorithms, such as in our MEL80 publication, where the only refractive outliers really were the, were the cases that we had done topography guided treatments in transplants. The other area of improvement was in case selection. Topography guided treatments were highly effective for cases like zone enlargement and recentration of decentrations. However, they were found to be less effective in irregularly irregular astigmatism, such as central scar or wound gape from a cataract incision. In other words, if the epithelial profile itself was irregular, uh, topography guided treatments didn't work as well. However, with appropriate case selection, we then published excellent results uh, with of zone enlargement and recentration. Now, in contrast to wavefront guided treatments, the question of whether this could be used for primary treatments was really not raised until recently. Uh, this became a hot topic with the FDA approval of the one of the lasers recently. And together with this came hyped marketing. The marketing message was the first personalized LASIK procedure, which was highly inaccurate and certainly deceptive. The main area for development in primary treatments was the question of how best to correct astigmatism. And this has become a minefield. If we look at the components of astigmatism in manifest refraction, this is made of the anterior corneal astigmatism, the posterior corneal astigmatism, the crystalline lens astigmatism, possibly retinal astigmatism because of the shape of the back of the eye, and then neural adaptation, which all have an influence on the manifest refraction. Now we were using you know, these late generation uh, topography guided treatments in 2005, 2006, but because of Paolo Artal's publication where he described that corneal aberrations in most patients, most eyes, balance and compensate for internal aberrations. It was therefore clear to me that removing corneal aberrations, there would have been a risk of exposing, revealing internal aberrations, and therefore it didn't make any sense to just blanket, uh, go and treat virgin eyes with a topography guided treatment. And a similar concept applies to astigmatism because as Noel Alpens explained, ocular residual astigmatism is what you are left when you subtract the keratometry from the manifest refraction. There have been different approaches described as to how best to account for this, including the Alpens vector planning method and the Alcon Four Cities topography modified refraction method. But if we look at the literature, it shows very mixed results. There are studies that show better results with manifest astigmatism than TMR. There are studies that show better results with TMR than manifest. And there are studies that show no difference between the two methods. So it really puts into doubt whether we should really be using topography guided treatments for all cases or just for those with irregular corneas, such as uh, this one. Here's an example of a patient of ours who presented with a complaint of double visioning or ghosting even through their glasses, and you could see inferior steepening, which accounted for the vertical ghosting. Now, obviously, before doing any treatment for this patient, you have to first exclude inferior steepening from keratoconus, which we were able to do, obviously with the pentacam, but confirming it with epithelial thickness data showing thicker epithelium over the inferior steepening zone. A topography
topography-guided treatment in this case achieved excellent regularization of the topography and an increase in contrast sensitivity. So in summary, topography-guided treatment has become an established modality for therapeutic um, treatments and in primary cases with asymmetric topography, but it has largely been abandoned for use in all virgin eyes. Let's talk about SMILE. For SMILE, which obviously came shortly after FLEX, following the initial studies, there was a cautious rollout to selected users. However, alongside this, there was a big marketing push promoting SMILE as the next generation treatment. The th it was called the third generation, building on PRK and then LASIK. Now, in the early days of SMILE, SMILE was nowhere near as good at visual recovery as, as LASIK, and the main work was being done to improve the procedure by optimizing energy, spot spacing, and, and, and energy settings to improve the speed of visual recovery and avoid cases with irregular cutting, irregular astigmatism that sometimes occurred due to OBL and crosstalk between the inter interfaces. With SMILE being a new procedure, a lot of work was also done to design and optimize surgical instruments for interface separation and to refine the surgical technique. There's also been a lot of work in the understanding of different complications in SMILE and how best to manage them, such as developing a cap recovery technique, different methods of identifying lenticular remnants, and a protocol for all possible scenarios uh, associated with suction loss. As mentioned, the original marketing of SMILE was not ideal as it was aiming to position SMILE as being better than LASIK and PRK. This caused competition between centers trying to use SMILE as a selling point over other clinics not offering SMILE. However, what actually achieved, it actually achieved was to breed a lot of confusion in the patient population and possibly caused previous LASIK patients to think that they had been, uh, had, they'd had the wrong procedure or that they should have been told that this was coming down the road. Subsequently, the marketing message around SMILE has actually become a lot more integral and it is now uh, common really to communicate that all procedures have preferential uh, benefits and that the surgeon is the one who should really determine which one of the procedures is best for any particular patient or any particular eye. Probably the main area of differentiation with SMILE is the control of spherical aberration. As would be expected, there is less spherical aberration induction with larger optical zones. However, due to the biomechanical advantage of SMILE, it's possible to use and safely use larger optical zones, gaining the benefit of reduced spherical aberration induction with less tissue consumption. In our study, we found that we could achieve 64% less spherical aberration induction, despite 30% more tissue being removed and leaving the cornea 30% stronger on average. So SMILE has now become an established procedure with repeatable safety and results. And there are now other companies following in the footsteps to uh, copy or develop their own versions of SMILE. So I've given you a few examples of these marketing cycles that have been uh, hyperbolic and sometimes um, abandoned. Uh, here's a list of, of a few procedures, some of which are really in the graveyard of failed uh, refractive surgical uh, procedures. Um, I hope that this talk uh, gives us a little bit of uh, time for discussion. Uh, I hope over time to tackle and address in detail each one of these and maybe more. So I want to thank you very much for your attention.